everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This program is brought to you by Regional Dairy Specialists with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Today we will be discussing critical calf care, decision making for urgent dairy calf health situations. In this episode five of the series, we will cover total calories, nutrition, and scours. This is the fifth episode in a seven part series. If this is the first portion of the series you are viewing, we hope you will tune into our other sessions as well. Recordings will be posted on the Northwest New York team's YouTube page. As a reminder, this content has been approved by the National Milk Producers Federation FARM team as continuing education. Add your participation in this program to your records for your next animal care audit. Today's presenters are myself, Margaret Quasdorf, Dairy Management Specialist with the Northwest New York Dairy, Livestock, and Field Crops team. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Casey Havakis, who holds a similar role with the North Country Regional Ag Team. Before we jump in, we do want to remind everyone that we are not veterinarians and that the materials presented today are for educational purposes. We strongly encourage all farms to have veterinary client-patient relationship and that you consult your veterinarian as the need arises. In today's webinar, we will cover nutritional scours and how to identify and treat it. We'll talk about the appropriate percent solids of milk or milk replacer to feed, along with calculations and considerations involving total calories. We'll finish up with the latest on colostrum. Let's get started. So when we typically think about a scouring calf, we're thinking about a sick calf, one that is dehydrated with sunken eyes, a weak suckle reflex and no energy. And we all know that a sick scouring calf takes a lot of time, resources and energy from us in order to recover and continue growing. So no one really enjoys taking care of sick calves because it's so much more rewarding to spend your time on healthy calves. So it's understandable why people are so quick to want to treat aggressively at the first signs of scours. So what's the main sign we recognize as scours? Typically calf caretakers will see loose manure and that might be enough for them to diagnose. But that doesn't mean necessarily that the calf has contracted an infectious pathogen that requires antibiotic treatment. A calf with nutritional scours will be a healthy, bright calf with little to no signs of dehydration. It will exhibit white, milky looking scours, but again, the calf will not appear overly sick. White, milky scours can also both indicate rota or coronavirus in calves, but typically these calves will display more sickness behavior. If you're not sure, contact your vet for diagnosis. Nutritional scours, on the other hand, is not as immediately dangerous to calves as pathogenic scours. Um, it could cause a little bit of dehydration, and it's not normal and requires some troubleshooting. So how do calves get nutritional scours or loose manure? It could be that you're feeding your calves on a very high plane of nutrition and that there are so many groceries going into that calf that more manure is passing quickly, leading to that white milky manure. Nutritional scours might also occur if calves are being fed incorrectly diluted or poorly mixed milk replacer or a poor quality milk replacer that may cause calves to be unable to properly absorb nutrients. If you do think that your calves are dehydrated, you can always feed an electrolyte two hours or more after milk to help maintain hydration status and electrolyte balance. But let's fix the cause and not just treat the symptoms. Let's talk about osmolality. Osmolality is a concentration of dissolved particles in a fluid, so the sugariness or saltiness of milk. It plays a role in water balance and passage rate in the intestines. Whole milk is typically 280 to 290 milliosmoles per liter. Milk or milk replacer that reaches about 400 milliosmoles per liter is starting to be at a hypertonic level. That is pulling water to itself in the digestive tract, which causes a decrease in the emptying rate of the abomasum. Slowing the emptying rate of the abomasum in calves significantly, which happens when milk and milk replacer reaches above 600 milliosmoles per liter, can lead to colonization of the small intestine with pathogenic bacteria, which research has shown to contribute to abomasal bloat in calves. This is partly why it's so important to mix milk replacer and additives properly, and to make sure that the water is available at all times so that calves can help regulate their own gut. Osmolality is influenced by lactose and ash content in milk replacer, but can also increase as the bacteria count increases in whole milk, 
like when cows have a significant mastitis infection. Here's a list of missteps related to improper osmolality of milk or milk replacer fed to calves. The first one is feeding too high intake as a percent of body weight. And Casey's gonna talk more about that in a moment. The second is inconsistent mixing or delivery of milk. Some milk replacers mix best at different temperatures depending on how they're made. Too hot or too cold of water to, can disrupt your mixing consistency. So make sure that you read the directions for your milk replacer and know that they're not necessarily the same for a different kind. The third thing to watch out for is excessive or inconsistent additive concentrations. Again, these things can concentrate the milk in an inappropriate manner, causing nutritional scours. This is also why it's important not to mix electrolytes in with the milk, unless it is a specific electrolyte product that is meant to be mixed with a certain amount of milk and water. Again, check the label and uh, check in with your nutritionist to be certain on that. A fourth misstep when it comes to osmolality is feeding milk in which there's a high bacterial count. So that would be milk that was improperly pasteurized or milk that sat around without refrigeration or in a large amount in a cooler that couldn't bring down the temperature quickly enough. Milk that was transported in such a way or for a length of time that would allow bacteria to grow or milk that passed through dirty equipment or was from cows with active mastitis infections may also uh, contribute to issues involving osmolality in calves. All these things will contribute to the potential for nutritional scours. Moving on to lactose. Lactose is a natural sugar in milk. It's a source of energy, but it also acts as a natural laxative for calves as it pulls water to the intestine. Excessive lactose levels in milk replacer leads to a lower gut pH, creating an acidic environment. This acidity may cause damage to the intestinal lining and cause poor nutrient absorption. And you might see mucin casts in the manure as well. Excessive lactose and the acidity it causes in the manure may also be a contributor to hair loss on the tail, rear, and back legs of calves. According to an industry calf expert, uh, Noah, Le Noah Litherland, an estimated theoretical tipping point for nutritional scours associated with lactose intake for newborn calves is around about 1% of body weight or 385 grams of lactose per day. So it's best to stay under those numbers. Feeding the correct percent solids in milk or milk replacer is also important in avoiding nutritional scours. Cow's milk is naturally about 12.5% solids and our typical milk replacer goal is to stay within that 12 to 14% range. Any higher and you're dancing with the osmolality missteps and consistency becomes even more important. Inconsistency of percent solids in milk replacer or milk is one of the more typical reasons why calves may develop nutritional scours, especially if you have more than one person mixing milk replacer or if milk replacer is measured with containers like cups instead of weighed out. A 1% change in total solids is enough to cause digestive upset in our calves. So in order to ensure our consistency it is best to use a scale to weigh out the powder and weigh out the water before mixing. It's also a good practice to check your percent solids with a Brix refractometer. On a Brix meter, you'll have to add a factor of two to the reading when measuring percent solids of whole milk. In addition, different milk replacers will read differently on a Brix meter depending on their makeup. So it's important to check with your nutritionist on what factor to add to be accurate for their specific milk replacer. Here's an example of how to calculate percent solids in milk replacer. The equation is milk replacer powder in pounds over milk replacer powder in pounds plus water in pounds. That number times 100 equals the percent solids of the milk replacer mix. So let's take a 100 pound calf and we're deciding to feed it one and a half percent of its body weight in milk replacer per day. So that's 1.5 pounds divided by two feedings giving us 0.75 pounds of powder per feeding. We also want to feed 13% solids. So that is 0.75 pounds of powder times 8.7, which is just one minus 0.13 for the percent solids we want to feed, divided by 0.13 equals five pounds of water needed to mix. 
So add up that powder and water and you get 0.75 divided by 5.75 times 100 equals 13% solids. If we're struggling with gut integrity in our calves, there's a variety of products on the market that are designed to help. Make sure that there's research behind the effectiveness of the product before purchasing and incorporating it into your feeding program. Common ingredients in these products not only contribute to intestinal integrity, but might also function to prime the immune system or support beneficial bacteria in the calf's gut or inhibit bad bacteria. Again, do your research as to what product might best complement your system. Next, we're gonna hear from Casey, beginning with total calories. So typically when we ask a producer how much they're feeding their calves, they respond with something like a bottle twice a day or a bucket twice a day or X amount of gallons and quarts twice a day. So this concept of feeding calves on a calorie and nutrient level is a concept that I've heard Dr. Mike Van Amberg speak about a few times. And I think he does a really good job of explaining that we need to start shifting away from this idea of calf nutrition and start thinking about it more on a nutrient level and on the calf's biology level. So when we think about it, when we ask a producer what they feed cows, they're not answering with something like they get one wheelbarrow a day or they get one skid steer bucket a day. They would answer with something like she's getting X amount of energy or X amount of protein per day. So this idea of interpreting calf nutrition in that way has gained a lot of traction. And I think it's something really important for us to consider. When it comes to the nutrient requirements of calves, we have water, energy, protein, vitamins, and minerals. And the nutrients are first going to go towards maintenance, and then any remaining nutrients are going to go towards growth. So when it comes down to maintenance requirements, we can calculate what that calf's maintenance requirements are going to be, and it can be described by the following equation that you see here. So when we use a calf weighing 41 kilos or 90 pounds, for example, their maintenance requirement is going to be approximately 1.6 mcals of metabolizable energy per day. And with that in mind, just make sure that you're considering that there's going to be um, exceptions to this. So breed, for example, jerseys are going to need a higher fat diet, and that's because of their surface area, and then also temperatures. So once we start getting into cold temperatures, it's important to remember that for every degree Celsius below thermal neutral zone, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius for calves, the energy requirement increases by 0.027 mcals per day. So then we have growth requirements. And the way that we calculate this is gonna depend on the calf's body size, as well as the average daily gain that you wanna target for your calves. So this chart here just gives you an example of at different body weights, what, and at different average daily gain targets, what that calf's maintenance requirement is going to be, what her growth requirement is going to be, and then it adds it up in the far right column. So let's go back to our, our original question. How many calories are in each of these and how much should we be feeding? Well, that's going to depend on what you're feeding and the composition. So this chart here is going over some of the energy content of popular feeds. So you have your 2020 milk replacer, your 2820 milk replacer, and Holstein whole milk. So you can see the varying energy content in, of each of these. And if this is not what you're feeding and you'd like to know what it is for the exact milk replacer that you're feeding, feel free to reach out. We have spreadsheets and we have formulas that we can calculate this very easily. So now if we put it all together, let's say we have a 45 kilo calf and we are aiming for a 0.6 kilo per day average daily gain. So if we calculate her maintenance requirements and we get 1.74 and that and then at an average daily gain of 0.6 kilos per day, her growth energy requirements going to be 1.76. We add those together, we get a total energy requirement of 3.50. Now let's say based on the previous chart I just showed you that you're supplying a 2820 milk replacer and that supplies 4.74 mcals of energy and they need 3.5. So if you divide 3.5 by 4.74, you are going to need 0.74 kilos of milk replacer required to meet your average daily gain goal of 0.6 kilos. So I kind of just ran through some of those numbers, but this is really just to show you that it's much more complex than just feeding what's on the tag of the energy or what's on the tag of the milk replacer. And how you're feeding and what you're feeding is going to be very dependent on your farm schools. So once again, if you need help calculating this stuff, please feel free to reach out to your local dairy specialist. 
Now, when it comes to feeding considerations, in their natural environment, calves have about four to 10 suckling bouts per day, which last about seven to 10 minutes per bout. So we can use their natural feeding behavior to maximize success in conventional or confined systems. So when calves are fed ad libitum in conventional systems, so via a peach teat or an automated feeder, we see that they have similar results. So when they have free range to feed whenever they want, they're going to have similar behavior with the four to 10 suckling bouts. And we wanna make sure that whenever possible, we're going to provide smaller and more frequent meals. And this is because feeding behaviors are learned behaviors. So we don't wanna get them in the habit of eating a ton of food all at once because once they transition onto a silage diet, this can increase their risk of slug feeding and developing acidosis later in life. So the last point I wanna make on this slide is that if calves are only fed twice a day, you're gonna to wanna to limit your meal size to 1.25 to 1.5 gallons per meal. And that's okay, it's okay to feed that much milk. It's actually been shown in some recent research in 2016 that two week old calves were able to consume five to nine liters of milk per meal without any negative consequences. So you're fine to feed these higher levels of milk within a meal without sacrificing your calf's health. So moving on to solid feed provision, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's very important that you're providing starter to your calves. And it's actually mandatory now, along with water provision, starting at three days of age, according to the FARM requirements. So starter intake is going to promote rumen development, and that's because it's going to stimulate butyrate production through the fermentation of those carbohydrates in the starter. And there's also some recent work done by Emily Miller Christian out of the University of Florida, suggesting that providing hay is very beneficial from a feeding behavior standpoint and rumen health standpoint and it doesn't necessarily reduce starter intake. And then one of the other important takeaways, if you are going to provide hay, is that you wanna minimize the opportunity for calves to learn to sort. As I just mentioned, feeding behaviors are learned behaviors. So if calves learn to sort when they're young, they're just going to be at more risk of carrying that behavior over later in life. So if you do provide hay, we suggest providing it separate from their feed source so that they don't learn how to sort. So to wrap up the webinar, we're going to focus on colostrum management, and we're going to go over things like the quantity, how quickly she received it, and the quality of the colostrum that she received. Okay, so when we look at the amount of colostrum that's required, this is some old research from 2005, but still very important. So when looking at the amount of colostrum that calves receive, two liters versus four liters, we can see that the calves that receive four liters has significantly better average daily gain, significantly higher survival through second lactation, and they produce significantly more milk through their second lactation. So it's just important to see here that colostrum intake impacts lifetime performance. So it's not just during their pre-weaning phase that it's going to you know, promote health and help them grow. It really does have an impact through their adulthood. So when it comes to timing, we also wanna make sure that we're getting the colostrum into the calf quickly. So this graph is showing the IgG concentration in relation to the timing after birth that the colostrum is fed. So here we have colostrum that was fed immediately after birth, so zero hours, and then we have six hours after birth and then 12 hours after birth. So it's very obvious here that at zero hours, the IgG concentration is much, much higher than at six hours and 12 hours. So, you know, there's some people that still say that, you know, as long as you're getting it into them that um, within 12 hours, they'll be fine. But this evidence is, is really good data to support the theory that you want to get it into them pretty much as soon as they're born within the first two hours to make sure that they're maximizing their IgG concentrations. And then lastly, I just want to point out that feeding more colostrum if quality is compromised or if timing is late is not a good strategy. You need to be feeding good quality colostrum and you need to be getting into them quickly. You can't just feed more and hope that it cancels out. And this is kind of this kind of goes with timing. We want to make sure that we're getting it into them. So there's actually no difference between IgG absorption and concentration when calves are bottle fed versus tube fed. In a perfect world, we're going to be trying to bottle feed our calves first. I think it's just nicer for the calf. And from a personal preference, I would just prefer to see calves are, you know, the first attempts at a bottle. But um, this data is really nice data to suggest that it doesn't actually impact 
the overall IgG concentration. So just to recap and talk a little bit about quality, we want to make sure that we're feeding the highest quality that we can. So usually that's going to be over 22 on the BRICS reader. Um, and just note that you can't tell the quality of colostrum just by looking at it. So I know there's a couple of theories out there that if it looks really you know, dark and yellow or you don't have that much of it, it's gonna be really good quality, but that's actually not scientifically proven and we can't make that assumption. And we wanna make sure that we're milking cows as soon as we can to ensure the best possible quality and avoid dilution. Cleanliness really does matter and any bacterial contamination can reduce the quality of the colostrum immensely. You should also consider pasteurization to make sure that calves are getting the best quality colostrum possible. And it's important to note that poolings, while not recommended, um, it can come from a different dam and when done correctly, pooling can work. There's just a lot of considerations to be had. So now we're gonna quickly touch on transition milk. So what we have here is a chart comparing the components of colostrum versus mature milk. So we can see some pretty big differences in our colostrum and mature milk, especially in terms of gross energy, our IgGs, and then there's all these different components that are pretty high in colostrum and then pretty low in mature milk. But what about the stuff in between? So there's been some really nice work that's been done recently comparing calves that were fed transition milk versus calves that went from colostrum straight to whole milk or milk replacer. And I think it's really important to note that the five milkings following your initial colostrum milking can be really beneficial. And there's a lot of really great nutrients for the calf. So when we look here, we can see that, you know, even like lactoferrin, insulin, your growth hormone, your insulin like growth factor, they're still in really high amounts in those milkings following the initial colostrum milking before it turns right to transition milk. So in this particular study, um, calves were fed their initial colostrum feeding, and then for six meals up to, the, up to 72 hours of life, they were either fed whole milk or a mixture of colostrum and whole milk, and that one-to-one -one mix was designed to mimic transition milk, or they were kept on colostrum. So these pictures are showing the jejunium in respect to villi development. So the colostrum and transition milk, you can see have a lot more villi development. It, there's actually no statistical difference between the villi development between the one-to-one -one mixture and the colostrum, but there is a big difference in the milk fed calves. So it's really interesting to see here that just by feeding that additional transition milk, it really improved gastrointestinal development. And there's a large opportunity to increase this development simply by feeding the transition milk versus going straight to whole milk or milk replacer. And we can see similar results here when we look at the IgG concentration in blood. So all calves were fed colostrum for their first meal. And then for their second meal, they were either fed a blend of 50% 50, 50 whole milk and 50% colostrum, which again, is supposed to represent transition milk, or they were, they were switched directly to milk. So we can see here that even after the second meal, those colostrum fed calves and those calves fed the 50-50 mix, we're able to have higher IgG concentrations compared to those calves that were transitioned directly onto milk. So to wrap it up, some key considerations. Nutritional scours are different than pathogenic scours and it's caused by the amount of inconsistency, contents and temperature of whole milk or milk replacer. Understanding calves nutrient requirements and what you're supplying is an important part of achieving your growth targets. Please make sure that you're providing calves with access to solid feed and water. Not only is it critical for growth, but also their welfare. Good colostrum management, and that includes aspects of timing, quality, and quantity are essential for successful passive transfer and transition milk feeding can promote gut health and development. So thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Please submit your questions to the, the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar, and please join us for the next session on Jan on February 9th, 2021, which is titled 911, My Calf Needs Help. Both Margaret's and my contact information is on the screen below. Please reach out to either one of us if you have any further questions. Um, we also welcome any questions that folks have um, for our panelist session that's in two weeks. If you have any questions for our expert panels that um, is gonna be hosted on February 16th, please feel free to submit those to us um, either in the chat box or um, feel free to email those to us. 
and we will get those answered on February 16th. Okay, so it looks like we did just get our first question into the Q&A box. So the question is, when feeding milk replacer, has anyone ever heard of putting a calf in, putting in calf saver during cold temperatures? Sorry, I can't read today apparently. <laughs> so have you put um, calf saver into your milk during cold temperatures? Or is it recommended to do so? He might be talking about like a energy supplement, but I'm not familiar with that particular one. So maybe somebody else is. I'm not familiar with that particular add-in, um, but I am familiar with some research that was done adding an energy supplement to milk replacer to calves during the winter months. And I can't recall the exact details from that research, but I do believe that it was beneficial. Um, it's, yeah, just like an, if that's what, if that's what you're referring to, just as like a, an energy supplement to help them get through those colder temps, then I can find that paper and send it to you if you would like to put your email in the chat box and we can discuss it a little bit more. Yeah, I, along with that thread, um, if we're adding an energy supplement, I just want people to think about the cost of that energy supplement and um, are we getting a return on it? Maybe just doing another feeding of milk is uh, more cost effective. So you should push the numbers on seeing, are you getting the return out of that product that you want? It might make you feel good, um, but maybe just another feeding of milk or milk replacer is gonna get you the desired results. Okay, so we have another question um, that says, I recently recently read that calves could develop diabetes later in life if they were fed too much milk for milk feeding. Is there any truth to this? Yeah, I can start off with that one. So that was some of the research that I was referring to from the 2016 um, data from milk si or meal size. And I think that used to be a theory that it could have some negative effects on calf health. Um, that research and then also some very recent research, I think either 20, uh, late 2019 or sometime in 2020, I can pull that up too. Uh, some of the work done by Mike Steele's group at the University of Guelph has shown that that's not actually the case. So take that within reason, right? So your 1.25 to 1.5 meal size is where you want to limit that. Any higher, we don't recommend. Um, maybe Betsy, Margaret, and Alicia can add to that. But if you're limiting to that 1.5 gallons per meal rate, then you're not going to compromise that calf's health or risk her developing diabetes later in life. And if you would like to send your email in the chat box too, then I can send you those particular research papers done by those um, research groups recently. And just as a reminder, um, all of these presentations are being recorded and posted on YouTube. Um, we're sending out the links to those in the follow-up emails. Um, and in that follow-up email should also be included a link to a box folder that has all of the resources mentioned throughout these presentations, as well as PDFs of the slides that we present. Um, and all of those obviously have our contact information on it. So please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have additional questions that aren't answered during our sessions. Next week's session is February 9th, and we're gonna be talking about 911, My Calf Needs Help, focusing on timely calf euthanasia. And then our final session in the series is on February 16th, which is going to be our expert panel. Um, and if you have any questions that you want us to specifically ask our panelists, please feel free to email those to us um, and we will make sure to add them to our list. And with that, we thank you for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you back here next week. And thanks for filling out our survey. Bye everybody.